Hello and welcome to today's expert webinar presented by Accountants World. My name is Div Bansali and we'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes here at the top of the hour with Randy Johnston's presentation today. Just a reminder, if you haven't yet downloaded Randy's presentation, you can do so under the Handouts tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see a PDF there called Tech Update 2017 and you can follow along with Randy throughout the presentation. Thanks again for joining us today, and we'll get started in just about 90 seconds here. Expert webinar presented by Accountants World. My name is Div Bansali. I'm a vice president here at Accountants World. And joining us today is Randy Johnston, the CEO of K2 Enterprises and he'll be discussing a 2017 tech update. So once again, I wanted to thank you for joining us today. If you're not familiar with the GoToWebinar uh, control panel, or if you haven't used it in a while, just a quick <coughs> refresher, you can click the orange arrow to expand or hide the control panel. So if it's in your way of seeing the, uh, the presentation screen, you can, uh, you can collapse or expand that. You have two audio options. You can listen via your computer audio or via dialing in on phone. If you select phone call, it'll provide you with a dial-in number and access code and a PIN, so you can go ahead and hear from there. If you haven't yet downloaded Randy's presentation, uh, simply go to the Handouts tab and you'll see techupdate2017.pdf in there. You can follow along with Randy from that. And then finally, if you have any questions during the presentation, click on the Questions tab type in your question and click send and uh, Randy will be answering some of the questions throughout the presentation and we'll be sticking around for a couple of minutes afterwards as well if there are any additional questions. We do offer one CPE for this webinar today. That uh, CPE is based on active participation and active participation is demonstrated by responding to all poll questions in the webinar completing the survey at the end of the webinar, and that survey launches after the webinar window is closed. If you don't see it, don't worry about it. We'll send you a link to the survey via email afterwards. And also being logged into the event for a minimum of 50 minutes. CP certificates will typically be mailed out within 48 hours after your eligibility has been confirmed. Today is a part of the 2017 Expert Webinar Series presented by Accountants World. Our next presentation will be three weeks from today, Wednesday, June 21st, also at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Chester Elton will be presenting three ways to become a more engaged accountant and leader. Um, so if you haven't signed up yet, please go to awwebinars.com. That's Accountants World, awwebinars.com. And you can sign up for Chester's and all the remaining webinars from this year. A brief word about our sponsor, Accountants World. Accountants World is the recognized pioneer in cloud computing solutions for accountants. We've been doing cloud computing for longer than the term cloud computing has existed for 15 years now. Our mission is to use cloud technology to help accountants grow their practices by regaining control over accounting and payroll services. And so we offer full service solutions for client accounting and payroll, as well as for document management, websites, practice management, and much more. And one of the things that differentiates Accountants World, Accountants World is we always put accountants first. We never compete with professional accountants by selling our services directly to your end clients. Everything is sold only to accountants, and then you can private label those solutions for your end clients and customize it in any way you need to. I also wanted to mention another important webinar that we're uh, going to be hosting tomorrow, actually. Um, and this one is going to be presented not by Accountants World, uh, but by a CPA, by a fellow accountant of yours, Jim Sosinski. And his presentation is entitled, How I Grew My Profits 30% and Reduced My Workload. Uh, and then you can see there in this webinar, you'll learn how he balanced his workflow throughout the year to make tax time much more manageable. Um, three ways that choosing the right cloud-based accounting system helped him to gain unprecedented control over client engagements, how he boosted his revenue from payroll and eliminated compliance headaches, and finally, how he changed his billing model to make more money in fewer hours. 
If you'd like to learn how Jim has conquered many of the same challenges that I'm sure you face in your practice as well, please join us uh, tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. To register for that, you can go to accountantsworld.com, and about halfway down our homepage, you'll see the graphic for Jim Sosinski's webinar, and, uh, and you can click through to register from there. So looking forward to seeing you back with us uh, tomorrow at 2.30 Eastern. Before I turn it over to Randy, a brief word about Randy. No one intersects the world of accounting and technology like Randy Johnston. Randy has been a top-rated speaker in the technology industry for over 40 years. His firm, K2 Enterprises, of which he is chairman and CEO, is a leader in providing professional education to accountants about technology uh, as well as accounting services. Randy was inducted into the Accounting Hall of Fame in 2011 and he has been selected as a top 25 thought leader in accounting for the past seven years in a row. And so at this time, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Randy. Superb. Well, thank you, Div. And uh, it, as it turns out, I uh, am pleased to have so many of you with us today. And we're going to step through the tech update presentation. At the end of the presentation, I have a fair number of guidance in terms of products. Uh, don't expect to get to that section of the materials. It's really there for your reference. Uh, but we will get through quite a bit of material here over the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So uh, I think Div's really outlined pretty well that uh, you know, we're going to step through lots of different technologies, including some general observations, items related to Microsoft uh, uh, strategies, some cloud strategies, as well as a little bit of hardware and security along the way. And what we're trying to do is help you understand the current technologies that you should be using, what you might consider in the near term. Most of the things we're talking about you could implement today or over the next uh, three years. So you've seen a, an introduction on me, but I set up a so yeah, six years ago I always show a picture of the family before I get started. So you can see here uh, at the uh, baptism of the most recent granddaughter, Aurora, there in the middle. Uh, we basically try to get together as a family pretty often. Daughter Mary there, who's the mother, is actually going to be working the Tony Awards uh, uh, rehearsal Thursday and on Sunday. So she's managing wardrobe or assistant wardrobe manager for Miss Saigon. But we enjoy our family so much. I hope you've had uh, you know, good time with your family in the the very recent past. We certainly spent a bit of time on Memorial Weekend uh, doing that as well as this past weekend. So the basis of the facts in this presentation come from my NMGI company, which supports businesses from uh, Boston, Honolulu, 24 by 7, and my K2 company, which Div uh, outlined for you. But the key thing here for references, we have additional websites, which are all CPE basis uh, websites. Uh, no tracking in those sites. Understand that most websites have tracking. Ours do not. We're just trying to summarize products and some of the guidance. So for each of these different areas of CPA firm technology or accounting software or paperless, we run individual sites on all those. And uh, you, you might recall that later this year on the 21st of August, there's going to be a, an eclipse. And Syzygy is actually the technical name for that. And eclipse is a Syzygy, but not all Syzygies are eclipses, as it turns out. And what I'm trying to get you to do is think about your technology alignment. That's a real big deal as we see it. And as I watch technology, I watch all sorts of different things. And one of the things that's, uh, I'll say, a bit of a bother for me is some of the new five uh, digital brain disorders, which I've read about, that are being considered for classification in the psychological diagnostic, diagnost, diagnostics, I'll get it out, next year, uh, nomophobia which means no mobile phobia, the feeling of panic one has when you're separated from your phone or tablet. Uh, technoference, the loss of relationship quality with one significant other due to device interruptions. Uh, you have uh, the phantom ring when you think your phone is ringing, including false alarm. And cyberchondria, which is similar to hypochondria, uh, where people are actually incorrectly diagnosing their, their illnesses with Google. And the Truman Show is illusion, a, a perception that your life's being watched by others. Now, as it turns out, those are legitimate. You might kind of be chuckling about it, saying, wow, is that, well, yeah, that's actually pretty true. But at this point, we're 
ready to give it a good whirl here on the first question. Remember, you need to answer uh, three questions to qualify for CPE today. So I think at this point, uh, Div, you want to introduce this question? Absolutely. So uh, all attendees, you should be seeing your poll question open in front of you right now, which is which of these new digital brain disorders do you suffer from? And you can select one or more of the following, nomophobia, technoference, phantom ring, cyberchondria, or Truman Show delusion. So remember, you can select more than one. Make sure to click the submit button to make sure that your vote is counted. That is required for receiving CP credit today. And it looks like we've got the majority of people have voted at this point, so we'll give about 15 more seconds here for everyone to get their vote in. And just a reminder, uh, it is required in order to, uh, to receive CP, you must answer this question, and, um, and we will have, uh, we'll have two more during this presentation as well. All right, so we're going to close it out in five seconds here. Going once, going twice, okay. All right, so Randy, it seems like the most uh, popular choice was nomophobia, um, but interestingly, all of the responses got at least 20% of people to honestly admit that they suffered from them. Yeah, and as it turns out, Dev, uh, the literature that I've read on some of these is pretty, uh, I'll say, insightful and ugly at times, but that's not the idea of today's presentation. So we do know that social media continues to uh, you know, be used extensively, but we also know that the younger users are not using Facebook and Twitter. They're going on to other things like Marco Polo and Snapchat. And we also know that mobile users or mobile usage uh, continues to increase, but we're concerned about things like distracted driving deaths. We thought it was fascinating that the new iOS version that Apple has announced has disablement for the driver, but unfortunately it can be turned off. And when we look at you know deaths in the country of about 30,000 a year for driving deaths, we'd really like to see less distracted driving deaths, and we think self-driving cars will help with some of those things as well. But let's look at a little bit of general observations here together because we really think the office of the future is different. I think you're going to use more conference boards. The Google Jamboard, the Microsoft Surface, or Smart, or Cisco Spark boards are all examples, and I've got links for you to follow if you'd like more information on it. The Jamboard really was just uh, shipped here May 23rd, and you can see it's about $5,000 with some uh, annual maintenance fees. A lot of these boards do have that. They're multi-site multi-user interactive boards and we think there'll be quite a bit more of this type of activity as we go forward. Further, we have been proponents for five plus years of things like standing desks, but we wanted you to see some of the other things that were happening with voice and, and so forth. So here's an example with the alt work desk. It is actually a lay down desk, probably the closest thing you can think of. It's kind of like a dentist chair, but you have your monitor up above you and the keyboard is actually there uh, kind of blocked from view at an angle, but literally you can lay flat and work. Uh, another example is at the right there, the exercise at work setup where you can basically set up a conference room with treadmills and stationary bicycles and so forth. Uh, these types of deployments are actually becoming a lot more common. In my own business, Every person has stand-up desks and ergonomic chairs. We think that's actually fairly important. In fact, you can see uh, son Dave there on the left in the red shirt. You can see his ergonomic chair uh, rolled off to the side. But we want your people to be healthy for the long term, and we find pretty universally when we visit businesses that the ergonomics are not thought about. Voice, I believe, is going to help us. Uh, we recognize right now about 35 million Americans who use some sort of a voice interface at least once a month. Uh, we have devices like the uh, Amazon's Alexa, uh, the Echo or Dot. Uh, Siri's coming along. And Apple introduced uh, their HomePod uh, this week, for, uh, available in December at 349. Uh, Microsoft's got their new device out, and Cortana's doing okay. But frankly, uh, you know, some of its lack of use on alternate platforms is a little bit of a problem. Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook has been building a uh, device in his home 
it's kind of like the Iron Man device in the movie. He calls it Jarvis for that matter. And there's a number of things that can go right and wrong with these voice interfaces. Uh, malware bad guys basically have gone after these voice activations and, you know, asked the question, you know, uh, you know, what's a Whopper from Burger King? And the answer wasn't very attractive. And so if you've got products in your mix, you need to be a little thoughtful about protecting that. The Google Home device is running about 24% share with the uh, uh, Amazon Echo taking the other three quarters market share or something like that. And when I look at these different devices, they all have their ecosystem that they're supporting. Uh, Google's home device is very tightly integrated into the Android phones and uh, you know all of those lines. And Google continues to be a very dominant provider of applications. So right now it's pretty much a horse race between the two uh, devices with Amazon's Alexa, uh, the Echo Dot family, and the Google Home. But we also wanted to have you think about what these devices mean because uh, a number of the devices are being used in court cases now. Uh, examples of the Bentonville, Arkansas case where a smart utility meter basically noticed that 140 gallons of water was used between 1 to 3 a.m. and that calls were made from smartphones and Alexa was standing by listening to conversation without the activation word. But actually had recorded what had gone on, which was a new revelation uh, in this particular realm. In Ohio, we've had a case where a heart pacemaker was used to, to uh, document uh, an arson and insurance fraud situation. In Connecticut, a situation where a Fitbit showed that the wife was actually walking around after her husband claimed an intruder had already killed her. And so these type of things are all controlled by what's known as third-party doctrine. When we agree to the license agreements, we're actually giving up a fair number of rights, and we've really committed to more of what I would call public exposure. Uh, and as these devices get more sophisticated, I think they'll become good assistance, but they can be somewhat intrusive. The Echo Show, which is kind of a video version of the uh, Amazon Echo device, has just become available. And uh, later in the summer, we'll see the Echo Look. This one's kind of a weird one. You put it in your closet, it looks at how you're dressed and makes recommendations on how to dress uh, better. So these Internet of Things devices are going to become very broad over the next five or ten years, but we're worried about the security on the Internet of Things. We almost refer to them as the Internet of Insecure Things because there were so many fails out there. And if we think back about the denial of service attack that occurred last October, uh, those were from the unsecured Internet of Things devices, and a whole bunch of them were rounded up and used to attack. The standard setters here, ZigBee, Z-Wave, IOTivity, and so forth, are not doing a real good job of locking up the operating system. So there's reason that if you use these in your business or home, that you need to segment and segregate these on separate VLANs from a security perspective. Now, another thing that's been big, we've called this the decade of workflow, and obviously Div just told you that there's going to be some workflow uh, webinars in the near future from Accountants World. Uh, there's some pretty major things going on out there. You've got Microsoft Power Apps and Flow. You've got Zoho apps that do this. You've got these in eFile Cabinet. Uh, you've got Trello uh, used by many products, including the Accounts World product and so forth. There's lots of customizable workflow tools that are out there, and we believe that they improve the user experience, the interface, controlling the workflows. We see a number of products that are offered directly inside CPA firms to try to do this type of work. We see them inside industry as well. and the mobile apps that are out there are also uh, more useful from a business decision-making process. So we see a number of real-time reporting and management tools from these mobile items. But when we start looking at the assisted document retrieval areas, the whole idea that you can bring not only bank feeds, but maybe the images to support them. Them, which is a feature that Accounts World's added this past year, is pretty fascinating. And we watch how these different vendors are building products to help us with the, the kind of manual document automation. Now, probably 15 years ago, there was a, a, 
a, a pretty large trend towards what was called enterprise architecture and service-oriented architecture. Uh, this really was occurring in the upper end accounting software marketplace. It's been moving down market. And these attributes were integrations between operational systems and business development systems like CRM and financials on the backside. There were banks and payment services in. We also started to see a lot more business logic and workflow. And we're starting to see some of these systems rise. For example, Ask Amy is a artificial intelligence assistant that will schedule your calendar for you via email, and it does it fairly unattended. So you can have somebody outside your company and yourself go back and forth and set appointments with these type of tools. The integration points can happen within an entire suite or in best of breed, it can interface to individual applications. We think that's all pretty interesting. So we're seeing this in a lot of the mid-market softwares, tier one, tier two, tier three, the larger to mid-market accounting softwares seem to have that, and we see it in Acumatic and Microsoft Dynamics 365 and some others along the way. So it turns out these changes inside the office, uh, you know, are going to drive, I think, the way we use people for customer service, the number of people we have in our office, and so forth. So, so Div, this might be a good time to just get in the second question, I think, at this point, and uh, we'll let you kind of take that one. Okay, sounds great. So I'll go ahead and launch the second poll question right now. And so very simply, the question is, how many professional staff are in your office, including yourself? So you can select one to two, 3 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 25, or more than 25. So we'd like to get a better sense of what types of firms uh, the attendees here today represent. So please go ahead and select one of those five options. Click the Submit button. You have to click Submit in order for your vote to be recorded. And just a reminder, this is the second poll question, and voting in the poll questions is required in order to get CPE credit today. All right, so we will take about 10 more seconds here for anyone who hasn't voted yet. And please remember to click the Submit button after you've selected one of the options. All right, going once, going twice. Okay. All right, Randy, so we have just under half of people. Uh, half of the offices represented here are one to two professional staff. 22% uh, are three to five, and then sort of a split uh, between medium-sized and larger offices. Super. I appreciate knowing that, and I'll kind of tone uh, some of the other presentation knowing those numbers. Thank you, Dave. So, uh, you know, Microsoft is uh, making some pretty big changes here, and I wanted to talk to you about a few of those things because we believe this will affect your budget and some decisions you might make. In early May, they introduced their new Windows Cloud operating system. Our rule of thumb is that for business purposes, you should just ignore this. It is really designed to run on low-powered devices like ARM devices and be used in schools to compete against Microsoft's Chromebook. And so this is much more of a consumer operating system, and Microsoft's going to have a lot of flash around that. But I got to tell you, I think for most of your business purposes, you can fundamentally ignore it. Some things that are interesting, though, in here is the support of OneCore and Metro apps inside this operating system. We'll see that support in the third quarter when Windows 10 is updated with the Redstone 3 release. And that's actually a pretty important thing we'll talk more about in just a moment. Microsoft's uh, stock is doing well. Part of that is because they're, they're adding quite a number of customers in their Azure data centers. And uh, Azure as a strategy works for a lot of uh, developers and a lot of companies. But the pricing for some small instances here is still high. Microsoft's doing a pretty good job at following hosting laws by company and replication. Amazon doesn't do quite as good a job in that area, for example. Uh, Microsoft has been adding proprietary hardware. Uh, they added field programmable gate arrays in their data centers last year, just like Google has done the tensor processing units in their data centers and so forth. So that's another reason for the growth area. But I'll keep just two primary things in mind the Windows environment and the Office environment for many of you. A lot of you use these tools. We're asking uh, businesses to budget $100 per user per year for Microsoft Windows licensing. We believe in the Redstone 3 fall release that Microsoft will implement 
do, you must have a subscription to get Windows policy. And if you're a Mac user, don't feel too good about that because we think Apple is on the path to do the same thing. And it actually has forced me to look more at Linux again this year. Now, as it turns out, the release cycles for operating systems is a big deal too because at this point, the original release to manufacturing Windows 10 from July of 2015 is completely unsupported at Microsoft at this point. Microsoft stated that they're only going to support the current version of the product, which is the version that came out in March, actually on April 11th, uh, the Creators Edition, and the prior version, the one that came out last August, the Anniversary Edition. Uh, Microsoft said they're going to get in a cycle where they release their updates two times a year. I'm not wild about the timing of their releases with March, about March 10th, and about September 10th to be the prime release update times. And for those of you who are attending in public practice, I can't think of a worse time to update my operating system than them, but that's what Microsoft's going to try to force out. The latest version of Windows has some new virtual reality things in it. Uh, again, from a business perspective, we don't really see uh, much uh, current application for a lot of the changes in this version of the operating system. But this idea about putting ourselves into a twice a year update cycle with Windows we think is a big deal. And when we look at the other operating systems, I've included in the presentation the end of life date and the end of mainstream support date for all of these different operating systems. For many of you running Windows 7, you can see that you're about three years out from your end of life date. So we, if you're doing a one-third a year replacement cycle like many businesses do, you're probably replacing now with some of your Windows uh, 10 operating system and new hardware. And that's another reason we want you to budget that $100 per user. Notice that Windows 8.1, it's going to go out till January of 2023. And... Windows Vista and all prior versions are now officially dead as well. So to me, it's interesting that the Windows 10 original release is dead and Windows Vista is dead at this point, no longer supported by Microsoft. Now, Windows 7 had some security features in it for pre-breach and post-breach activities. I've shown those in this particular slide, but I want you to understand that if you upgrade to Windows 10 over a machine that's had Windows 7 or Windows 8, you get a few more features. That's actually good, and the security in Windows 10 is better, by the way. But we think a better strategy is to install native in 64-bit mode on uh, with Windows 10 because you get some more things. So if I can, I'm going to roll it back. You can see the things that were Windows 10 in an upgrade situation and the things that are included if you do native installs. So at this point, we believe that for most of you, you are far better off doing Windows 10 in a native install. There's a feature that's been in Windows 10 since the get-go called Windows Hello, and it will do fingerprint verifications and it will do facial recognition, and it will incorporate multi-factor authentication with the YubiKeys and, and some other types of pieces out there. So this is very accurate and because of PCI compliance standards that change February 1 of 2018, where multi-factor authentication is going to be required for anybody who has access to credit card information, we're broadly recommending the deployment of multi-factor authentication this year, whether you use the ones listed at the bottom there, Duo, Authanful, you use the Microsoft or Google authenticators, and so forth. Give some thought to that because it's ready for prime time and we think it's a wise thing to do. We also know a fair number of you are running Microsoft Office 365 and Randy's rule of thumb right now for CPA firms is to not use Office 365 for businesses to use Office 365. Notice the two extremes there. And I can go through a lot of reasons why. Uh, Microsoft has two primary versions on Office 365, although there's about 30 in total. And there's security scores on the enterprise and on the small medium business version. The small medium vis business version has a 257 point security scale in it. And if you have not run securescore.office.com, if you run Office 365, you should do that, and you'll get a result that looks something like you see here. Uh, this was done by one of our K2 team members when we first 
discovered this particular rating tool, pretty much everybody had a score below 20. And you can do some things to improve your security, but you're going to notice that you know, there's a lot of improvements you can make in security. So if you're using Office 365, we strongly encourage you to run this tool and improve your security. Almost everybody's got a poorly installed Office 365 from a security perspective. Now, Office 365 provides you the Microsoft Office Suite currently in 2016. That's been out long enough. I don't know that there's significant features to talk about there other than the Power BI tool has continued to improve for reporting and lots of vendors are creating content packs for these applications. And we think that'll be a pretty long-term play for Microsoft. Well, let's turn our attention to the cloud for just a minute. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that are going on in this area and this is quite a revolution. It's taking longer than I had thought it would. Uh, you know, uh, the Accounts World folks first started creating their product uh, 17 years ago, as I recall, and we believe that the right way to do cloud is in a browser, SaaS, the style that they're doing it. But hosting, unfortunately, is the bridge technology, and we think it's just a short-term thing. Vendors who are providing hosting, you need to be real careful with because a lot of them don't have the uptime support or speed that we think is required. We want you to use uh, two-factor authentication whenever you're using these type of things. And so when vendors approach you, you want to make sure that they have redundant data centers, for example, might be one of the key things that you ask for plus the other attributes there. The big boys of Amazon and Google and Microsoft with Azure and Rackspace, they're all trying to compete for this business. Amazon clearly has the largest market share there. Google's been trying to break into the business with more Microsoft SQL and server code and so forth. That really is probably for those of you who are larger attendees if you're going to do hosting in some sort of fashion. But the fact of the matter is on productivity apps, many of you can do uh, well with Office 365. Some of you, frankly, though, could do just as well with Google's G Suite or Zoho's Docs or LibreOffice, just to name you know, the various competitors there. And the fact of the matter is, if you're using only a small percentage of Microsoft Word or Excel, I'm thinking these other products may be less expensive and just as productive for you. Uh, is Office going to run win in the long run? Probably, but you know, if you have uh, line workers who don't have to have the Microsoft Office functionality, I have routed a number of clients to the other three major competitors there. So you know, there's a number of CPA firm apps that are SaaS. I've tried to list a number of these here for you, just so you can see, you know, the pieces that they have that are SaaS. But very few vendors have everything in their product line as SaaS today. Accounts World's one of those. Uh, we see some new uh, development with Thompson at Omvio and so forth. So it's going to take a while still for most of these competitors to transition. And when we look at accounting software, a lot of players have entered the market with products that are not feature complete in some cases, don't have costing, don't have inventory, and that's a bit of a concern. But SaaS is pretty much everywhere. We count roughly 30 cloud-based products uh, out there today, like Zoho, uh, that are trying to break into this market. We see a little bit of it in the mid-market, too. So understand that when you're looking at these apps, that it's going to be one thing for them to be robust if they're SaaS, and it'll be another thing if you need to scale up higher. So Microsoft is going to push a lot around Dynamics 365, and they've got a Tier 2 and a Tier 3 offering in this area. But the key thing that is interesting and different is licensing by role or licensing by app. And a lot of the vendors that are doing this type of work are in there and you see fixed scope implementations on these mid-market and above tier one tier two tier three types of offerings well you know the the next thing i think i'd like to step over into is a little bit of hardware and in the case of the hardware world this is the biggest changes that i have seen in years and, you know, you'd think hardware hasn't been changing that much. It actually hasn't over the last few years. But there's multiple things here that I need to call out. 
and uh, among those are uh, the storage changes. And if we look at this, uh, you'll notice first off, something as simple as the SD or USB world has changed pretty amazingly radically over the last few years or in the last year or so. Uh, you'll notice I've pictured three different type of SD formats uh, with a different speed class. And most of the time, if I'm having you buy SD cards today, I actually want you to work for the look for the V90 video speed class marks. If you're using these uh, cards in your cameras or you're shooting video, they'll perform way better, and they're very little money more. We also have seen offerings like the uh, device down below, the Kingston Data Traveler called the Micro Duo 3. It has a micro adapter and a USB adapter. The phenomenal read-write times here are pretty amazing. They claim 100 megabit a second to write, uh, 100 megabit a second to read, and 15 megabit a second to write. But I can tell you, I've used this and transferred three and a half gig from the stick to my local machine in about six seconds. So. You know, I'm looking at it saying, wow, something really happened here to make these things radically faster. There are products for uh, Apple Lightning connectors with USB on the other side from Lexar and some other vendors. So if you haven't looked at the new high-speed stuff in SDs, USBs, uh, and SSDs, I'd ask you to look at some of that. And we're going to see more of it in memory and other uh, pieces here as we go. Now. That said, one direct piece of buying advice that I have in hardware for you is if you buy laptops or desktops this year, you need to look for this thing pictured in the middle of this slide. NVMe on PCIe M.2 is how it's actually uh, read or the way you pronounce that. Now, what this is is a new high-speed interface for solid state drives. For the last five years or more, we've recommended that you buy solid state drives in your laptops and desktops for lots of reasons. And it doesn't matter whether you run in the cloud or you run local, solid state drives improve your performance. And traditionally, these solid state drives are interfaced with SATA, which has a top speed of about 600 meg. Uh, some of the solid states were hooked through serial attached SCSI. And the top rate of that was about one and a half gig. This new PCIe Gen 3 has four channels that run about four gigabit per channel. So in a most common configuration right now, you can get about 16 gig of throughput. And it can uh, be expanded over time, but it's about 25 times faster than using a SATA interface. The design is such that over time, this particular technology will support up to 32 channels, not four. So we'll see, you know, more like 128 gig throughputs through this mechanism. And how much does it cost when you buy it from HP or Dell or Lenovo or whoever you're buying your hardware from? Eh, maybe $40. So for me to get you to go from a disk I.O. perspective about 25 times faster, it's about $40. So Randy's rule, I don't buy anything from any vendor unless it's got NVMe on PCIe M.2. So that might be one of the things you just hadn't heard about that is real critical, I think, in current purchases. Now, uh, some of you are small, it looks like from the survey, and you might have uh, network attached storage in your office and your home, and we're seeing a lot higher end capabilities here. Uh, Storage Craft is one of the most popular backup products, and as it turns out that uh, Storage Craft can now actually be used in a virtual machine on a network attached storage device, and a lot of these network attached storage devices have server grade processors. So I want to cite two different vendors here of these products, one of them called uh, QNAP, and a particular model I cited, although there's lots of models from the vendor, their TS531X has dual 10 gig interfaces, and it's only about $649. So if you're really storing data on a local NAS, if we can get you to spend just a little bit more money, you can get radically greater performance. And where we think this is going to go is what used to be the performance domain of storage area networks is now going to be that down in the NAS. So today, a storage area network 
a uh, low end bottom price about twenty thousand dollars you see here 649 by the time you drop solid states in there you might have a thousand dollars tied in 20 times cheaper for similar performance that's a great big deal the other thing that's happened in QNAP is they've gone to a 64-bit operating system there's and that's got more performance and more flexibility there's lots of things going on with this company and one of their competitors called Synology uh, they have lots of different units I've got pictures there of the 30 uh, 17 40 17 and the uh, uh, 18 0, 17 but their 2017 is about $8,000 for the base unit, and it can have 250 drives in it. And, uh, you know, the technical people that I've talked to uh, about this said that that's about 1.8 petabytes of storage. So if you look at the recent uh, movie Piracy with Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, this is the type of unit that stores those big movies and so forth, and you can move a lot of data around for not a lot of money at this point at very, very high performance. So we see these used in big data centers and maybe on the back end, but Synology has some little tiny units like QNAP has as well, but QNAP doesn't have the great big units like Synology. There are some consumer NASs out there, Drobo, Netgear, Western Digital, all are good examples. Uh, you can get four terabytes of storage on a Western Digital unit now for often less than $100, but always less than $200. So we've got lots of choices in this world. Now, uh, on a storage area network, uh, you know, if you're running storage area networks, the, my rule of thumb is don't use the predictive units. That would be vendors like Nimble that have those. Uh, and you can see the names of some of the big boys down at the bottom that are often used in big data centers. I, I just want you to understand that the storage area network market is changing very, very radically. The vendors are trying to rationalize their offerings. They've made a lot of acquisitions, and they're trying to roll that stuff all together. So what's happening in the big data centers is on the back end, the the data center managers are trying to figure out how to use these different devices and what they buy and so forth. But that's kind of what's going on in that side. But the hardware change that in my mind is the second most, most notable, or maybe it's the first most notable behind that solid state NVMe approach, are CPUs. Because for the first time in a decade, I am adding AMD back into my recommendation mix. Now, I just haven't thought that there's been a good enough price performance value for most AMD offerings for, as you can see, for over 10 years, something along that line. And this chip market for has been evolving fairly rapidly, but then it started to slow down. And Intel had nearly a monopoly on CPUs for Windows and Mac computers for a long time. Uh, they just introduced their third wave of 14 nanometer chips called coffee lakes, which are supposed to ship in the fall. And part of the issue here is they are trying to build a new generation of chip, 10 nanometer stuff called Cannon Lakes, that they've delayed multiple times. The current delay dates out to 2018. And so this coffee lake was kind of a stagger step, and AMD stepped in with their new Ryzen chips. They're very competitive from a performance, but they're unproven. That's it only thing that keeps me from wholeheartedly saying go after this. Now you'll see in the materials I have some QR codes here and there. If you want to see some background information in more detail you can look at it this way. But AMD numbers the chips kind of like Intel did, you know, Core i7s and Core i5s. In this case we want you to only really be considering the Ryzen 7s and the Ryzen 5s. Later in the year we'll see some server grade chips and some notebook chips and so forth. These are very, very capable uh, processors. But a couple of things you should know. Uh, the Ryzen is only going to run on Windows 10 and Linux at this point. Uh, there's some speculation that Apple will support this with the Mac OS. And AMD specifically wanted to support Windows 7 8, 8 1, And Microsoft said, nah, we're not going to do that. So uh, about the only other downside as we see it is that cooling appears to be a bit of concern with some of these chips. They run a little hot. And so over the next 90 days, we'll be able to figure out, yeah, this is a good recommendation or not. But we're thinking right now it's actually fairly good. So stepping back over to Intel, the seventh gen Intel uh, processors called Cabby Lake only support Windows 10. Well, there's a little bit of 
limited Windows 10 support as you go backwards. And the only place you really get Windows 7 support guaranteed is on the older 4th and 5th gen chips. So notice that this the availability of the hardware now is going to start driving what we can support on the software side. So I think we're actually getting forced into Windows 10 or Mac OS or, or Linux, and it's going to have to be up on these higher-end chips. Now, Microsoft has said they expect to deploy Windows Server on the very simple ARM chips to use in their Azure data centers this year, and they've already announced you know the uh, ARM uh, Windows Cloud stuff, but they're going to put Windows 32 emulation late in the year, uh, as it turns out, on these real, real simple processors. So there's there's a lot of movement here. I don't want to get too much in the weeds. I did compile a grid for you to talk about these different generations of chips, when they were released, what their you know uh, architecture, their uh, geometry is, transistor size, and the RAM they support, and so forth. But you know, the net to this is pretty straightforward. We believe that most of the second half of 2017 hardware purchases will be using 6th to 8th gen Intel Core i5s or i7s, and maybe AMD Ryzen's 5 and 7s. So if you look at this timing of the 6th and the 7th and the 8th gen uh, chips in the Intel world, I've tried to put the 7th and 8th side by side here for you. Our general rule is that uh, you know, use the desktop chips if, uh, if available. And what you uh, also might learn is that even in laptop computers, you can use desktop chips. They just don't get as long a battery life, but they run faster. So you'll see U-series chips available in uh, laptops for that reason. And, you know, if you don't have to run on battery very long, we actually recommend desktop chips in laptops because you get a lot more speed. You just give up battery life. Now, global PC shipments, uh, you know, have been trending down, but we're still seeing, you know, 250 million plus uh, units shipping, but the market has been shrinking. I kind of get that, though. You know, a lot of machines don't need to be replaced as often because you've got enough horsepower in the local machines, and they're more reliable, they're lasting longer. So where in the old days we might have replaced them every three years, I'm stretching some of my replacement recommendations out four and five years at this point because there wasn't enough difference to justify it. So if you look at these forecast volumes, uh, you can see that the uh, you know traditional PCs, you can see some decline there and you see some growth in the ultra mobiles. Uh, but you know the ultra mobile tablets, you can see that's relatively stable. Uh, over the recent past and the projected future. Now, all of the vendors are trying to put in some uh, competitive features in their products to, to maybe attract you to their line. Uh, my recent machine upgrade was to a, an HP WorkWise box, and I bought it for the security filter reason, but it, I also thought it was interesting that the, uh, you know, the product that I have is also mil-spec, so I can drop it from six foot uh, onto concrete without breakage, which is a pretty interesting thing. And another thing that they've done is if you walk away and you've paired your phone, you can actually force the computer to walk out when you, you don't have a phone that's in Bluetooth proximity. They allow you to log in that way too. I don't think that's as wise as somebody steals your phone, your computer, they have the keys to log in. But I think it is pretty smart when you walk away to have your computer logged out. So there's some things that have happened there in the um, management. This happens to be illustrated with HP. You're going to see features like this later in the year from Dell and uh, Lenovo IBM and others. That's kind of a big deal. So as we think about these competitors, you know, the other very popular machine right now is in the Microsoft line. Uh, you know, mid-June, the Microsoft Surface Pro will be out. I left this as Pro 4 here for you. But basically, you've got the high-end computer Surface Book, which Brian from my team carries. And you've got a very interesting uh, desktop unit, the Surface Studio. But both of the Surface Book and Studio are quite expensive units. To get one that's really properly configured, you're going to have to spend $3,500 on the Surface Book, and you're going to have to spend pretty close to that $4,000 numbers on the Studio. And when you start looking at price competition, 
uh, from others, hey, I think there's some better values out there, but there's nothing quite like the Surface Studio except from Apple in some of their product lines. Uh, the Surface Pro family, though, has sold very well with several million units in play, and not a bad computer. It's kind of a, a nice portable size. So, simple advice. If you're picking a computer, pick 6th to 8th generation Intel i5, i7 processors, maybe the AMD. Avoid the i3, the Atoms, the Celerons, and make sure that you get a solid state drive that has NVMe uh, PCIe 3 M.2. We think 16 gig of RAM is smarter, but 8's not bad, and we always want you to pick business grade uh, hardware if you've got it available. Now, a few other things that have made pretty good progress, uh, displays. Uh, we're encouraging you to only buy 2017 models of this. I hope you can see in my materials that the upper monitor is much brighter than the lower monitor. And that's because both quantum dots and nanotechnology are used in the 2017 displays. So the angle of incidence, the viewing angle that you can use is, is much better in these new generation monitors, and we think it's actually worth spending some money to get that. Uh, there's other functions like SureView, uh, the HIPAA filter that's in my new machine that I think is very handy, keeps people from looking at your work from an angle, and uh, you know, in airplanes or commuting, a lot of times that happens, and uh, it's not a really a good thing. Now, a uh, picture for you here is uh, Stina Irvinshard. She's a, a nifty person. She actually uh, is kind of the inventor of the YubiKey uh, multi-factor fob, which, by the way, as you saw in the Windows Hello slide earlier, is now supported for login purposes. There's a lot of things going on in on security. And you know, in our last few minutes together here, I just want to talk about some of the things that are happening with security. Uh, my theory has been that all software has bugs. A typical iOS app has about 10,000 lines of code, and there's between 10 and 50 errors every 1,000 lines. So, you know, a 10,000 line uh, iOS app uh, product might have 500 bugs in it. And uh, Vinton Cerf, who really is the father of the Internet, basically said, look, for us to put in credit card uh, protection in the Internet transport, it might take another 500,000 lines of code. And you do the bug math on that, a lot more out there. So Robert Watson from the University of Cambridge says you got to assume that everything's vulnerable. We've seen some hardware developments where we can run code securely in a protected area called a sandbox at this point, and that's good. But we also see other developments where, for example, in February in Israel, uh, researchers showed that they could read data flying a drone outside an office by simply watching the computer in use and the hard drive light and some other activities. That was pretty fascinating. The NSA here in the United States is uh, widely believed to have built deliberate weaknesses in some of its favorite encryption technologies, which the more things unfold on that, the more we're finding that to be true. Uh, Department of Defense uh, basically says they've found a vulnerability in every weapon system that they've examined. And, uh, you know, this whole thing is turning into a, an escalated cyber war, particularly with state actors. So the only way to really remedy this is we see insurance. And we've recommended cyber insurance in this presentation over the last couple of years. Uh, PwC basically says, look, uh, you know, less than a third of the U.S. businesses have it, and we think it's going to require this because a lot of the technology companies are fighting this, but I just don't see how they're going to get the holes uh, uh, shored up. And if you take recent attacks like the WannaCry virus where, you know, it infected a lot of different systems, uh, you know, over a period of actually only seven hours, these type of attacks are becoming far more common. They number about 4,000 per day just to give you a little perspective on this. So it is impossible in our mind to have antivirus and firewalls protect us because there's so many variants that are created all the time. And another edge area that we're concerned about is your homes because, uh, you know, we want business-grade firewalls used in the homes, but, you know, the least expensive business-grade firewalls might cost you, you know, 250 to acquire and $250 for the services, so $500 in a year's time. So we've seen 
introduction of some managed security devices for homes that are running in this $10 a month range like the Cujo or the Semantic uh, Norton Core and so forth. And that's actually kind of interesting, but we're not ready to recommend them at this time because they're still too new to really say they, they work well. Uh, another technology that we'd like you to consider uh, deploying is mesh networks. It's a, a way of having wireless access points talk to each other, uh, far more reliable, uh, can take a lot more load and so forth. And the key mesh products that we think are worth looking at are Amplify, Luma, and Eero. I've listed a few more there for you. But if you're going to upgrade wireless in your office or wireless in your homes, consider one of these mesh units. I think you'll be pleased that you did. Well, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that you should understand is that uh, the phishing security attacks basically have a very short time to uh, attack. Roughly 1 minute 22 seconds according to Verizon breach data uh, to get attacked. And frankly, you are at risk if you have an M in your company name, I do, nmgi.com or frankly, .com, most of you have an M, because they can substitute, bad guys can substitute in ends. If you put senior employees on your websites, or if you accept resumes, or if you pay bills by wire transfer, or if you have a team in finance, which I assume most of you on the, on the webinar today are, uh, or if you have a LinkedIn profile or a Facebook profile, all these are attack vectors for the bad guys to use against you right now. So generally, we're asking for tools to be put in front of email services. So even if you're using Office 365 and think that Microsoft's got it protected, it doesn't. There's about a dozen or more tools that we've looked in this area, Mimecast being a pretty good example, that will filter the URLs in your messages. It'll filter attachments from Microsoft Office or PDF documents, and it'll actually do a little bit of impersonation protection for you as well. But it really additionally provides mail bagging to keep mail flowing, and it also uh, provides uh, archiving capabilities, which we think are fairly important as well. So uh, this whole idea of do I need some extra protection for uh, identity theft and uh, you know those types of things, spam control and others, there's unified products that are doing these type of things, Mimecast being a pretty good idea. So Div, I think it might be time to uh, get another poll question in. It looks like we've only got about three or four minutes left in our time together. Okay, sounds great. So I'll go ahead and launch the third poll question. And this is actually, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of a reminder question. Let's see how, how good your memory is. Um, because Randy talked about this a few minutes ago. What do you think the median time to first click in the average phishing email is? 8 seconds, 82 seconds, 8 minutes, 2 hours, not applicable. No one in our office will ever click a suspicious link. Um, so please go ahead and, uh, and select what you think is the, uh, the correct response there. And just a reminder, yeah. voting in uh, all three poll questions. This is the third question. This uh, voting is required in order to earn CP. Um, and please remember to click the submit button after you make your choice. Yeah, and Div, I might just mention while people are taking this, maybe we'll wait for the poll to close. But security is a real high profile issue. Uh, I had the pleasure of teaching security in an IRS, uh, for the IRS about to three weeks ago today. And I basically visited the dark web and showed how identity theft happened and so on and so forth. Uh, I've really concluded that all businesses, all sizes are vulnerable. And it turns out the statistics tell us that the bad actors, the hackers, if you will, are going after accounting firms with a vengeance. So the primary targets have become accounting firms, law firms, and banks. And uh, the banks are actually in pretty good uh, shape to protect themselves. Most of the accounting firms and law firms, not so much. All right, so we'll close the poll here in five more seconds. Please get your vote in if you haven't already. Okay, and Randy, it looks like more than half of people uh, selected 82 seconds, which is the uh, the answer that you uh, that you shared before, right? 
Yeah, it is. And in fact, uh, Div, you know, that, that uh, statistic is trending down and there are uh, thousands of phishing attacks launched every day as well. And I would also suggest that the bad actors are good enough now. They can intercept your email. They can write an email that looks just like uh, something in the office. So I'm actually trying to teach people now to really be thoughtful about clicking on the link or better yet, don't click on it. Just go type that link in yourself because a whole lot of links, a whole lot of PDF files, and a whole lot of Microsoft Office documents are infected with malware, which can really hurt you. Now, for our attendees today, Div, I'm just going to suggest I've got a couple of other sections on what I'd consider some future technologies and some recommendations and then a few fun things, but I'm exactly where I expected to be in our one hour of time together. So I think what I will do is just uh, say that I appreciate everybody being here and I provided that extra material so you can look at that in your leisure and uh, do appreciate you spending the time with me today. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time today, Randy, and your, your presentation was great as always. Um, I'm going to go ahead here and uh, and hopefully we can uh, show my screen in just a second. I'm having some pausing here. Randy, can you still hear me right now? I can. You're still with me. Okay. Um, my go-to webinar panel is just freezing for a minute while I'm trying to get my screen back. Um, but I do want to just mention here, and hopefully the screen will come up in a second, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Two final uh, to-dos that I'll give to you. Number one, uh, please fill out the post-webinar survey in order to make sure that you receive CP credit. As soon as you close out of this window, that webinar uh, survey window should pop up. Um, but if it doesn't, uh, you'll receive a link to it in our follow-up thank you email as well, and you can fill it out from there. Only need to fill it out one time, so if you do fill it out right after the, uh, the webinar, you don't have to fill it out again when you get the email. Second thing I wanted to mention is Jim Szynski's webinar tomorrow, a CPA talking about how he grew his profits 30% while reducing his workload. Um, please sign up for that if you haven't already. That is at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. So today's was at 2 p.m. Tomorrow's 2.30 p.m. You can go to accountantsworld.com um, and you scroll halfway down the homepage and you'll see a register button for that. Um, so we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We look forward to seeing you three weeks from today at our next expert webinar with Chester Elton. And if you have any other questions uh, for Randy, Randy, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a couple minutes and we can see if there are any last questions here that come in as well. Um, but otherwise, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's webinar and at future expert webinars. Thanks again.